To some Canadians, Newfoundland and Labrador was invented for postcards, a landscape of jagged coastlines, fishing boats, and the magnetic pull of the ocean. For Mark Critch, Newfoundland is home. And while he doesn't see his beloved province in quite the same light, his growing up in 1980 St. John's does explain a few things. Mark Critch is one of the most recognizable faces in Canadian comedy. Welcome to the show! Best known as an anchor and roving reporter on 22 Minutes. Thank you for doing this, sir. You can choke people and you can... Throughout his career, he's taken aim at a lot of big names from fellow Newfoundlander Alan Doyle... What are you ass? <laughs> this is it, what are you ass? <laughs> ...to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, even that guy south of the border. It's not raining. Do not tweet that it is raining. God is not peeing on me. There's the Basilica behind us at the top of the hill. <laughs> Coming from a province known for its storytelling, Critch is now telling his. I, I don't swim. I don't skate. Oh, yeah, that was also interesting yeah, to me. Yeah, I don't, don't ride swim. a bike. His new memoir paints a picture of growing up in Newfoundland that's a little different than you might think. It's not a lighthouse. There's no schooners. It's not the no, Newfoundland no, experience. It's I met up with Mark Critch in St. John's for a tour and a talk. This place, what is it called? LPSU the, the Hall. The LSPU oh, Hall. LSPU Hall. What is what is this place to this, you? This originally was a longshoreman's protective union, so the longshoremen would come here and argue and yell and scream. And then the artsy crowd got in here like mice and made a little theater here. So this is where. I, uh, when I was 15 years old, I did my first show here. I came down here and asked to rent it, and they gave it to us on a 60-40 split, and we did the show, and then afterwards when they gave me the 60, I thought they'd made a mistake and took off. Uh, yeah, so this is the first place I ever performed anything that I had ever written. So part of your childhood is, is defined by where you lived, yeah. which we'll go and check out, but sort of remote... Uh, the house came with your dad's job as a reporter. Yeah, it was, it, dad was basically a lighthouse keeper, but his lighthouse was a radio station, and dad was a journalist, so he, uh, he was the last living person to cover Confederation with Canada, and he was, then he was, he was, when he was with a newspaper, and then he went on into radio, and uh, he was very well known around here for crime reports. Uh, because he had a very St. John's towny accent. So he was like, Mike Critch for the VLCM News Service, was, was it, the way he spoke. And um, everybody knew him. Everybody could do an impression of Dad. But he li we lived right next door to the station, which was on basically the, the Trans Canada Highway, because it was as far, they needed a high point for the transmitter. So, like, so sometimes a big black car would pull up here, and Joey Small would just put down the window of the car and kind of lean out and you'd look up and, oh, there's a premier like, oh, well, how are things today? Hey, things are wonderful, things are fine, things are incredible, jobs, jobs, jobs. And then, and then the car would just peel away. <laughs> like he wouldn't even get out of the car. So that was very exciting for me. Your mom too, though, was a, a storyteller oh. and a gossip, it sounded like. She knew what was happening everywhere. Mom, mom was perpetually talking, like constantly. One of the best stories is, and I didn't know that you, you were asthmatic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, epileptic. epileptic. So one of the best stories is when the Pope comes to town. Yes. And she gets it in her head that he can cure you. Yeah, well, not necessarily a curing, but you know, if your, your son is, it has what the biblical uh, writers would say, demons, uh, and <laughs> you know, and the pontiff happens to be in town, you know, if he does a drive-by quick wave, there's a good chance, right? He's stepping onto Newfoundland soil for the first time. And, just and you know, Pope had never been here before. Um, and so, yeah, so she they brought me downtown and we were out, it was a horrible storm and we had to wait for the, uh, the, the Pope to kind of go by and the Pope would be like, that was it. And it was like, you know, you feel better? And I'm like, I guess. And uh, yeah, and then we were trying to get out of there. The traffic was so bad, so she kept driving and then the Canadian Army um, tried to say, you can't come down here. And mom looked back, just pretend you're having an asthma attack. Said, I've got to get my son to the hospital. If he dies, it's your fault. And they're like, well, wave her through, wave her through. And we have like a motorcade and a police, and I'm like fake wheezing the whole time in the back, you know, starting to actually wheeze, you know, it was that kind of a thing. So uh, yeah, yeah. So I she, understood your mom when you, when you told that story. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. she's like, no, screw this. We're, we're, <laughs> we're going through, that kind of thing. And that helped, was very helpful to me, that kind of thing, because Later on, like people say, no, the prime minister won't do an interview, or no, you can't go in there because so and so's in there. Like, mm, I, you know, I fake an asthma attack, go through. There's always a way, right? <laughs> yeah, There's yeah. always a way. Yeah. 
Um, I wondered, being in that house, uh, sort of isolated, mm -hmm. I, I wonder whether that helped you become the person you are in some way, with your imagination or with your... Yeah, I, I guess there's, there's only two ways to go, I, I would guess would be like uh, some form of entertainer or serial killer. I think there's... <laughs> I think there's two, you know, kind of career paths at that point. Right here was where I did everything. So like I would be, my bedroom was right here. The TV was right here. So I would sit here and just watch Wayne and Schuster for it hours. It wasn't a very big house. No, it was, very, it was about the same size as the house across the street. Okay. It was just, yeah, a tiny house by today's standards, you know? Right. You were very much left to your own devices and, and you had to come up with something. So yeah, the stories and uh, characters and you know, little plays with action figures or what have you. And uh, that was, you know, your whole world was kind of in your head, you know. Which became sort of the challenge then when you got sent off to school, much to your horror. Yeah. It's because you thought they were joking. Well, I, th I thought this was not something that happens to a gentleman. <laughs> I have a fine life here, yes. Uh, I, I, know, I knew my brother, you know, got on a school bus, but he was much older and, you know, that, you know not as outgoing as I was, yeah. surely to God. But yeah, no, I had no idea. And there wasn't a big, I, big thing about it either, because I remember, like, you know, I grew up with no other kids around. And then all of a sudden, Mom's like, oh, I'm going to go get a book bag. And I'm like, oh, a book bag? Oh, I wonder what that's for. I'm like, I can put dinkies in it, I suppose. And then the bus comes, well, there you go. I'm like, Hi. Should we have not spoken about this more? <laughs> you know? And I get on the bus, and I'd never seen that many kids. There was like, I don't know, 30 kids on a bus or something. And I'm like, I, what the hell do I do now? And then I get to the parking lot. And then there's other buses. And I'm like, surely to God, they don't have children. They do. And then there were more kids inside the building. I thought, when does this stop? When does this stop? Is this the end? So yeah, yeah. So I had no idea how to like interact no. or, like with, with more than one child at a time or something. And you started to, I, I think it's the first time you got a laugh when you had to do this introduction at a, of a play. Yeah, my first laugh was I was playing the color yellow in the big show at the uh, school concert. and. Uh, Archbishop was there and everything. It was a very big deal. Uh, and I was saying, uh, Archbishop, Bishop, fathers, brothers, sisters, parents, uh, friends, and pupils. But I'd never seen that word. So I'd say poopills. And they'd laugh. And I was like, poopills. <laughs> they laugh. Poo pills. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Well, I'm getting this laugh. I remember doing that. And a nun just come and grab me and holler me off. And I'm seeing, like, you know, the, the bishop kind of, <laughs> and I'm like, he gets it. He gets it. He loves me. What are you doing? Put me back. So, like, that was, I guess, that was the first, you know, kind of a, oh, I see. Yeah. And yeah. then it became plays and, and the comedy troupe. The comedy and, stuff yeah. and, and all that stuff, yeah. So, what did they make of it then when they would see you? Uh, teasing the prime minister, running when, after minutes, because it, that, it, that's different than being on a stage, which is it, it, you know, impressive in itself, but to make a job out of mocking people yeah, in got, positions of authority, I mean, it's pretty. Well, I remember uh, when I was about to get the job, when Mercer left, and then they, um, they brought up myself and Majumder to Toronto for auditions, but then they got Colin Mockery to do it. So there was all this talk of us maybe doing it and then back home locally, like that got around. And then I was like, well, how did that get around? Because I didn't tell anybody. And then afterwards, when they, they said they want to have you be a writer and stuff, and like these media people are like, oh, I hear you're going to be, you know, uh, the new Rick Mercer and all this stuff. I'm like, what? Who told you this? And then somebody said, your dad has been calling around media and, and telling them, I got a scoop for you, Bob. You might want to know the kid. I got the contract here. Like he was very proud, you know, of that kind of thing. But then sometimes, you know, you'd say something or something would happen. He'd be like, oh, did you, did you have to do that? You know, did you have to go that? Far. And, was uh, there something that you can remember where he thought you did a disservice to? When, when Carolyn Parrish got kind of pushed out of uh, government because I got her to step on a George Bush doll uh, during the war. Hi, I'm Mark Critch. This week on 22 Minutes, we'll be talking to outspoken MP Carolyn Parrish about this guy, George W. Bush. Carolyn? Um, he was like, you know, oh, you've ruined this woman's life. You know, I was like, well, she stepped on it. <laughs> she decided. I, I didn't, you know. <laughs> and he's like, because that was a big thing. Because at the time, was, yeah. I got off. I remember getting off the plane from there. And 
the TV being on back in the st at, at, at work, and people were like, what'd you do? I said, why? Turned on, and Don Newman was there like, and she steps, at the 22nd mark, she steps on the head of George Bush. And what is this, what do you think this means, panel? They have a panel? And I was like, oh no. So like that kind of was like, oh geez. Yeah. You know, you see the ramifications, something you do. But for that, he thought that was a bit much, but he, but he still, that was on the front page of the, uh, of, uh, of the paper, the Globe and Mail, I think, the next day was a picture of her, her. And did you think it was too much? No, but I, I called her afterwards, right, yeah. and, and, and apologized to her. I said, like, geez, I'm so sorry this happened. And we had a nice talk. And yeah. she goes, you know what, screw it, it's all fine and everything. And uh, um, she was very nice about it. What is it, I've asked, I asked Mercer this question when he was wrapping up the show, and it's, it's still something I'm not sure I get, no matter how many books I read or people I meet. And what is it about this place that creates people like like you, like Mercer, like Alan Doyle, like all these people with these amazing storytelling abilities and comedic talents, and th like there's something here. Would you agree I, that makes people different? I think it's the same thing that kind of got me going, living in this weird little house next to a radio station. There's something about that isolation. Uh, there's something in Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that in, coming together in that small place, you depend on each other. It's a community. You know the people around you. You know what's wrong. If something happens, you, you fix it, that kind of a thing. But the, the storytelling thing is it's like we're, because of the isolation over the years and, and, and these small communities, you had to entertain each other as well. So if you didn't play an accordion or sing a song or a step dance or something, you had to do something. And the only thing left to do was talk, right? So, you know, you got to be good at talking. And Newfoundlanders are good at talking. Boy, if you want to get up in front of a bunch of Newfoundlanders and have them pay you $10 to talk, you better talk. Because everybody there can Tough talk audience. better than yeah. you, you know? Yeah. I think that's that, you know, that, that, that small place and entertaining each other really is, is where a lot of that comes from. Uh, I know you loved that, Rosie. You know, judging from the emails uh, when you were on that shoot, I thought we were going to need an extraction force to get you off the rock. And I know you two could have could have talked for hours and hours. Is yeah. there anything you left, you know, on the floor? Well, first of all, I caught at every meal, Adrian. I should, <laughs> like even at breakfast. And I don't think I had a vegetable that was not a potato. But other than that, it, you know, Newfoundland, I, people should, everyone should try and get there. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've been there. But it is a special, special part of this country. And the people there are so warm and so generous. Everyone we met. Uh, bringing them into our homes and, and telling us where to eat and, and drink and other things. So <laughs> a good time was had by all. All in the name of research. That's right.